In 2001, the president greenlit an operation known as Dark Winter. It was a real-world exercise that tested emergency response to a bioterror attack on the United States. The scenario of Dark Winter, a local smallpox attack on Oklahoma City, was designed to get out of control soon. And it did. The National Security Council on the one hand had to focus on locating the attack origin and on the other hand had to contend with the problem of the ever spreading virus. Unable to do this, it would lead to a breakdown in essential institutions, massive civilian casualties and civil disorder. Operation Dark Winter revealed how vulnerable we've become. We live in a fragile and complex world, a web of interdependent systems so complex we can no longer understand it. A house of cards, if you will. Remove just one and everything falls apart, creating a deadly domino effect that can cripple a society in days. And what is at the heart of this system? Money. Six years after Operation Dark Winter, a presidential arrangement was introduced, Directive 51. It promised an assurance of specific rights in a catastrophic emergency. This emergency describes a location-independent incident that threatens the American people, infrastructure, environment and political functions. If a real-life event similar to Operation Dark Winter was to happen, an organization called the Strategic Homeland Division would be activated. Extremis malis, extrema remedia. Desperate times call for desperate measures. The Strategic Homeland Division, simply referred to as the Division, started recruiting and training men and women from the populace for one of three branches, analytics, strategic and tactical. The main objective of the Division is to ensure continuity of government in the case of a catastrophic emergency. Until then, they return to their daily lives. Sleeper cells only to be activated if an emergency like Dark Winter was ever to occur. And it did. November 23rd, 2015. Black Friday was the day everything started to go downhill. But the story of how this came to be started earlier. Meet Gordon Amherst, a biologist and virologist turned bioterrorist. He believed humanity was too powerful on a global scale. And while viruses like the smallpox greatly held the human population in check for centuries, it had come to the point Mother Nature needed a helping hand. With the breakthrough of digitizing DNA, he started the process of growing lab-grade pathogens, using smallpox strains he obtained through one of his colleagues, Vitaly Chernenko, a Russian virologist. Utilizing a 3D biological printer, Amherst combined smallpox, H1N1, swine flu, Ebola, Marburg, Dengue and Hantavirus. The result? A virus so contagious it could be transmitted through the air and so deadly it could result in a 90% mortality rate worldwide. He called it the green poison. This brings us back to Black Friday. Using the greed that shows its ugly head during this day, Amherst applied his fires to banknotes, that which was the heart of our economic society. Starting out in Abel's department store in Manhattan, the pathogen jumped from tainted banknotes to human skin onto food, toys, children and loved ones. By the time patient zero felt the first sore throat, millions of people were already infected, earning its name the dollar flu. As simulated in Operation Dark Winter, the breakdown happened fast. On the first day, hospitals reached capacity and panic struck. The second day, quarantine zones were established, resources rationed and transport went into lockdown. Following that, day three. International trade stopped, oil dried up and the stock market collapsed. The fourth day, the power failed. The shelves were empty and the taps ran dry. After this, complete panic and chaos took over as people did anything for survival. The fifth day, anyone was a potential threat. At this point, the Catastrophic Emergency Response Agency, or SARA, took over field hospitals, treatment centers and safe houses, attempting to halt and contain the spread of the virus and create a vaccine. But as rioting and looting became worse, the SARA, NYPD and FDNY couldn't handle it anymore. As this happened, several local, state and federal emergency services and military agencies, including the NYPD, FDNY and National Guard, joined forces and formed the Joint Task Force, or JTF for short. But it wasn't enough. Understaffed and overworked with meager resources, the JTF have been stretched thin as ensuing unrest decimated their ranks. The JTF lost control of New York, leaving the city to turn into a lawless death trap for all its citizens. This gave rise to hostile factions that were taking over the city. Rioters, a leaderless group of thugs that rob and kill others to ensure their own survival. Rikers, escaped convicts from Rikers Island under the leadership of Larry Barrett. 
Unlike the rioters who are simply taking advantage of the anarchy, the Rikers are hardened criminals that revel in it, with a special distaste for the JTF. Cleaners, a faction consisting of former sanitation workers who lost everything during the outbreak. Formed by Joe Farrow, they are convinced that the only way to save the city is to burn down everything that is contaminated, including the people. And the most dangerous of them all, the Last Man Battalion, LMB for short. They are a private military company led by Colonel Lieutenant Charles Bliss. Hired by prestigious corporations to protect their assets on Wall Street, the abandoned LMB aimed to retake New York and establish a new world order by force. In response to this anarchy, the division activated its first wave of agents to carry out their mission and aid the JTF, with the brunt of the wave sent to defend central Manhattan, the place where the virus was originally released. But even the first wave's efforts weren't enough to stop the ensuing chaos. The division's operation in central Manhattan failed and the JTF was forced to evacuate and construct a wall around central Manhattan, creating the Dark Zone. Many first wave agents were left to fend for themselves. Aaron Keener, an adaptable and confident first wave agent, angered by the JTF surrender and retreat, disavowed the division and went rogue. He developed his own ambitions for establishing order and a future for the country or possibly the world, even if he was accused of high treason and branded a traitor of the United States. And we left our dead behind. Yeah, we're not supposed to do that. Hang on a second. But we don't leave people behind. We're here to make sure this city doesn't get left behind. But the people we're working with, they're just fine with leaving all of us behind if it's convenient. Look, I don't agree with every decision that's been made, but I am saying it's time to leave them behind. Their model doesn't work anymore. If we're smart, we cut it loose before it drags us down, before it kills us. His first actions after turning rogue were to recruit other first wave agents, convincing them to turn rogue and work with him in future operations. Agents who chose not to ally with him were murdered in cold blood. This triggered the division to send a second wave of agents to investigate as much of the first wave agents that appeared to have gone MIA. In the meantime, Keener met with Charles Bliss. Concluding a deal, Keener wanted to make use of the LMB's forces to establish dominance over Manhattan, while Bliss wanted to take advantage of Keener's shade technology to get an advantage over the other factions, especially the Division. The first operation was eliminating the Division commander, Louis Chang, whose Osprey was shot down by a surface-to-air missile turret, leaving him dead and the Division agent Fei Lao and the other agents WIA. After this event, the second wave took over the James Farley post office, used as a Sarah contamination station, and turned it into the base of operations for the division and JTF. From here, the division and JTF would launch a multitude of operations against Manhattan's hostile factions. Tasked with the rescue of key personnel, the division first set out to extract Jessica Kendall, a virologist held captive by rioters in a Madison Square Garden field hospital, where she was treating the sick and wounded. After her rescue, she took charge of finding a cure for the virus. For that, she needed samples of the virus strain, found in Abel's department store and Amherst notes located in his apartment. At the same time, in an attempt to restore power, water, food supplies and take back Manhattan, the division sent its agents to rescue Captain Roy Benitez, a former police officer and leader of the JTF at the Lincoln Tunnel checkpoint, and to rescue Paul Rhodes, an engineer working with the JTF at the subway morgue to restore the generators. Under the leadership of these two men, the division managed to push back the rioters and eliminate the leaders of the Rikers and Cleaners, leaving them scattered and unorganized, unable to form a real threat. Somewhere during this period, the division got note of possible antivirals in the dark zone. The division sent out its second wave agents to recover it, even though there was a terrible blizzard happening outside. Sent out by helicopter, the storm caught up with it and crashes the agents. Equipped with only a pistol, as most gear got lost in the crash, the agents had to find the antivirals in the dark zone. Upon finding the antivirals, the agents set out to extract them by helicopter, but at that moment was attacked by mysterious figures. Jamming their equipment and using shade tags similar to their own, these hunters appeared to hunt down division agents, both rogue and non-rogue, as they wore watches of the agents they defeated as trophies on their shoulders. While ruthless and equal in skill and technology, the agents managed to defeat the hunters and extract the antivirals. In the meantime, Keener investigated the outbreak on his own, eventually discovering that Gordon Amherst was responsible for the outbreak. During this time, Keener, as well as the division, intercepted a message of Vitaly Chernenko, the Russian virologist who worked with Amherst. 
He holed up in the Russian consulate, but after he was abandoned by the people from the consulate, he contacted the Russian embassy in Washington. They would have picked him up once the blockade was lifted, but before that was possible, the division sent agents to recover Chernenko. Upon reaching his safe room in the consulate, it appeared the LMB and first wave agents under the command of Keener extracted Chernenko from under their noses and took him back to the United States embassy, the headquarters of the LMB. As a response, the division and JTF launched an assault on the LMB headquarters, effectively driving out the LMB and eliminating Bliss. As their second objective, they needed to retrieve Keener and Chernenko, but an echo revealed Keener, together with virus samples, a 3D DNA printer, Amherst notes and Chernenko, took off per helicopter. It appeared Keener found Amherst's lab, stole as much as he could, put it into a double bag and left New York. Before completely vanishing from Manhattan, Keener left five phone recordings on the West Side Pier, detailing he was there to hunt down a few things he needed for his plans, attract the attention of the remaining factions to hinder the division, and let the second wave know that he slipped through the blockade, leaving Manhattan behind and setting his sights on the rest of the world. After this, the division focused on creating a vaccine for the virus, in which they ultimately succeeded and maintained control and order of Manhattan, every so often running into scattered groups of Rikers, Cleaners and LMB. But, then a distress call came from Washington DC. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the story, I would like to ask you to like or dislike, share, subscribe and click the notification bell to become part of the Mastermind HD community and notification squad. On top of that, you can follow me on Twitter for daily updates and join my Discord if you're looking for an engaged community that revolves around Tom Clancy's Division 1 and 2. Both links are in the description. Visit my Patreon page through the link in the description if you're interested in an intel brief with an overview of the summarized information from my videos. To end the video, I have a question for you. Considering Keener is still a threat with ambitions towards world domination, what do you think his plans for Washington DC are? Leave your answer in the comment section down below and I'll make sure to get back to you. I'll talk to you in the next video on Discord or on Twitter. Peace out.